Uh, Michael, thank you for the introduction and uh, for distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations on being out of bed in time uh, after that dinner last night. It is wonderful to see so many people engaged in a topic that is important clearly within the security community, but as I hope to describe to you, I think it's important well beyond the security community right across our country. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their leaders, past, present and emerging. Uh, when I was given the opportunity of addressing the conference and saw that the theme was 2020, 2025, uh, I thought somewhat excitedly of what could I draw from the Jetsons cartoons or that great leap out into the future of well, what it might look like for us and cast back on it. But then, of course, the sad reality hit me that 2025 isn't that far away, less than six years from us now. So uh, that sets in place a number of the elements of which I want to talk through this morning. And if you were to ask me uh, what might war in 2025 be, I would uh, invite you to then talk to intelligence officers, strategic analysts like we have in the room, fortune tellers if you were prepared to give that a go, uh, all of which would give you a view of what that might turn out to be. That is not my role. Uh, so I will not tell you what I think war in 2025 will be, but what I do want to discuss with you this morning is what is central to my role that Michael described on how do we make sure the advice that we're providing in the department sets the foundations for the ADF on what we need to be ready to do in 2025, no matter whether it's the fortune teller, the intelligence officer or the analyst who has got it right. So as you heard yesterday, and you had a, a marvellous set of speakers to you, uh, we're dealing with a world that's in transition. We're seeing the emergence of a changing strategic order globally, driven largely by the rise of China, but of course it's not the only factor. There's tremendous economic development across the Indo-Pacific region, in India, Vietnam, Indonesia and China as well as extraordinary global technological advancements. There's much said, and there's more coming today, suggesting artificial intelligence, autonomy, robotics, adaptive materials, hypersonics, pervasive situational awareness systems are our future. That's true. But many of those technologies are still developing. And in some cases, that's quite quick. In other cases, it isn't but none of them are yet at the point that we're in a position to bet the farm on them, nor will they provide the answer to all of the security requirements that we will need to meet, and they will have their own vulnerabilities, uh, which occasionally seems to be an absent part of that discussion. Uh, when addressing the UK Land Warfare Conference last year, the UK Chief of the General Staff, uh, General Mark Carlton Smith said, a Cyber 9-11 could have already occurred and we wouldn't even know about it. What that quote reminds us is of the difficulty in, in pinpointing the very beginning of conflict and how it may differ from competition. Last night, those of you who heard, CDF uh, made a number of comments and he indicated we can't rely on our traditional views of black and white phases of conflict the start of our next conflict may have already occurred. A threat of significant consequence could be at play. So the core theme that I want to talk to you about this morning is how do we know if we're already in a state of conflict and how do we make sure then that we haven't lost before it starts? And that's, uh, we'll come back and I'll offer you uh, my views. So, and that's where I think the theme of this conflict and the time frame that Peter and the team at ASPE have set is really clever. Uh, it deals with a period that many of the components of future military capability are already in place, what we call our force in being. Our systems of decision making are largely set, our enabling support, our logistics and our likely partners, 
which we might be leading. Other components will continue to change. The nature of any adversary, which could be state or non-state, presuming we have the ability to identify that adversary at all. We can't be sure where the Australian Defence Force will operate or how quickly we might be required to be in action. Our experience in 2014 in responding with just a few weeks notice to the rise of Daesh in Iraq is a good example to us. Our approach to these challenges lie in the perspective of Professor Colin Gray, the director of the Centre for Strategic Studies at the University of Reading. He said, expect to be surprised. To win as a defence player is not to avoid surprises. To win is to have planned in such a manner that the effects of surprise do not inflict lethal damage. To heed Professor Gray's message, we need to carefully consider the building blocks for the ADF. Capable equipment, excellent people, comprehensive training and contemporary tactics, techniques and procedures. We need to ensure those building blocks can withstand challenges ranging on that spectrum from competition to conflict. And it's important that we then build into our force resilience, agility, versatility and preparedness. We can't assume that any adversary will engage us on the terms we would prefer, nor can we expect that competition will remain a military on military battle. This new competitive environment involves the whole community through economy, trade, diplomacy, education, sovereignty and unidentified factors that will exist within the information, cyber and space realms. The coming decade will require Australia to be clear-eyed and self-reliant where we must be and deliberate about the statecraft we apply. Australia will need to be more willing and adept at deploying all our elements of national power in a coherent manner. The challenges we face in 2025 involve government, industry and importantly our community, all our participants. We're now much better placed to respond to these challenges than we have been before. But according to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, military expenditure by countries in the Indo-Pacific region is amongst the highest amongst all of the communities of the world in 2018. So we have to keep improving the capabilities that we have in order to meet these challenges. We need to ingrain resilience, versatility and agility into our force, into its enablers, and I mean this in the very broadest sense, and particularly into our supply chain. While improving our ability to act independently, we must nurture our key relationships, both domestically and internationally, ensuring our, well, our people are well equipped to analyse and respond to those challenges in whatever form they may take. The subject of war in 2025 is one that has wide boundaries. I'm going to explore just a few of these, but not all of them with you today. The information environment, in particularly cyberspace, is now recognised by us and many as a warfighting domain. Those who seek to do our nation harm can attempt to do so within the information environment where all of us operate every day. They can do it quickly, with relatively simple equipment and with significant consequences. The notion of using information for, for warfare purposes is not a new concept and CDF made that point very powerfully last night. Today, the word cyber is even more pervasive. We can't go a day without hearing it, about it in some context. The concept of information warfare might still seem a little too abstract for many people in our community to understand. But when we start talking to them about fake news, data leaks, hacking, scams, bots that artificially amplify advertising messages and the fight to keep information private, the picture starts to become clearer. Today's information warfare which is fought predominantly, but not just in cyberspace, 
I'd describe as reaching its teens. For the ADF, we've got some experience in the operational use of cyber. However, we ourselves are only just starting to grasp the potential of actions and opportunities that that domain presents. There are no universal rules for the use of information and cyber in competition. Some countries deploy their cyber capabilities with minimal accountability or approval. Others, like ours, require careful planning and rigorous approval to make sure their use is lawful. Space is also high on our areas of interest, both as a contested area and in one in which we should contest. We recognise that space is vital, complex and requires more of our focus and there are significant policy, physical and practical issues that we need to address. The Outer Space Treaty, which has been the foundation of space laws for decades, however, these are dated when we look at the technology that is available today. In a military sense, there's still work required to test the applicability of the rules of armed conflict when it comes to space. Few of the legal structures that exist terrestrially translate readily into the space domain. For example, some countries' laws allow the use of deadly force to defend property during peacetime. Unless in a declared armed conflict, Australia would generally only consider using lethal force to protect the life of a person. There are further complications surrounding definitions in space. Even for the most straightforward of concepts that we are otherwise well accustomed to. How do you define a hostile act in space? An adversary could destroy or interfere with data flow from a satellite without killing or injuring anyone. But the flow-on effects could have a devastating impact on a nation's economy or security. The problems we face in both cyber and space are pervasive and we often take the availability of those capabilities for granted. For our military, space opens up several opportunities for interconnectivity between our platforms, access to intelligence surveillance and improve partnerships with like-minded countries. Now that we're challenged in these domains, we're increasingly seeking to understand the extent of our reliance and vulnerabilities in those two domains. Defence's approach to space aims to build agility, resilience and versatility, ensuring that our force reacts appropriately in the event of loss of capabilities in space. We're also determined to build resilience to navigation, intelligence and communications when space-based systems are not available. To ensure we can be agile for 2025 and beyond, we need to establish our legal parameters, our processes, our policies, authorities and the rules and the tactics that we'd use for both space and cyber to ensure we haven't lost before we've begun. Defence is working with industry, academia, other government agencies and international partners to help fill the gaps in what are globally accepted behaviours in those domains. We will continue to promote and support research and development activities led within Defence by Defence Science and Technology to develop and introduce new technologies as we delve deeper into space and the cyber realms. And we welcome new ideas and perspectives from forums uh, just like this. Independent input and feedback is core in helping us to think differently within the department and keep focused on the right areas of capability. You are all part of our resilience and preparedness. The former Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, General Merrill McPeak said, the effective employment of air and space power has to do not so much with airplanes and missiles and engineering as with thinking and attitude and imagination. This applies, of course, not just to air and space, but across all realms and is an area where we should all be challenging ourselves. The last two decades have seen the ADF focused on the Middle East, and many of you, you in this room will have been part of that. To ensure we're ready for 2025, we must recalibrate 
and use our imagination to determine what the next contested environment may look like and the skills that we will need to be successful in it. Our ADF needs to exercise decision superiority, a notion that at its core is a human endeavour. It's conducted by people, between people, irrespective of machines, technologies and mechanisms. Decision superiority is analysis, deliberation and action. When things go wrong, decision superiority is reviewing, adapting and changing where it becomes necessary. In 2025, people will still complete analysis of situations, landscapes and risks, but machines will increasingly support us. We cannot prevail in 2025 if we continue to train in environments where we are comfortable. Our experience in the arid landscapes of the Middle East offer us some valuable but limited insights in the challenges that we might face in our own region. Defence is actively building preparedness into our people through high-end training using our national training areas and simulators to imagine new and different battlefields. Realistic, live, virtual and constructive simulation-based training is key to our future performance, especially in preparing for emerging risks. High-quality live training and trials areas like Woomera are a national and international strategic asset for this country. Developing, testing and training high-intensity and multi-layered scenarios in different contested domains will build our capability, enable us to achieve combat excellence and instill that high performance and confidence into our people. Yesterday, the Defence Minister made clear that partnerships will always matter to Australia. And I think CDF made the comment last night that Australia has never fought other than being inside a coalition. So we're enhancing the relationships that are important to us with the United States through increased combined training activities like the United States Force Posture Initiative, and with Singapore through the Australian Singapore Military Training Initiative, which builds enhanced training areas in central and north Queensland. They improve our interoperability and they help us prepare for these future challenges. We're building capacity through participation in regional exercises, Kakadu, Talisman Sabre, which commences soon, Pitch Black, RIMPAC and Oz Index, to name just a few. These challenge our people and platforms in demanding environments and strengthen both the inter- and intra-military relationships that we need to have. For Australia's interest to be protected and promoted, the diplomatic, economic and military levers of national power must be well coordinated. So while we're building experts in the battlefield environment, we're also training our people to be experts in the region. The 2016 Defence White Paper states, our security and prosperity depends on a stable Indo-Pacific region and a rules-based global order in which power is not misused and threats to peace and stability from tensions between countries can be managed through negotiations based on international law. The ADF's principal objective is to win the peace that avoids the conflict. And we'll do this by making sure we are ready for the day our combat skills are required by our government where that becomes necessary. The 2016 White Paper takes a proactive approach to defence strategy. And we're becoming experts in our environment through this training, prioritisation and the international engagement that in seeks to ensure we are relevant and influential in our region and the global environment. Our strategic weight and ability to proactively shape our environment is most credible when backed by significant investment in real military capabilities, delivering a capable, potent and agile force. This acknowledges that risks that arise in our region impact Australia's sovereignty and prosperity. We are fortunate to have the sea air gap but we can also be at risk of at our economic lifelines, trade and energy are disrupted because of that sea air gap. National capability and resilience requires us to manage all these risks. 
The resilience of our capabilities must reach beyond the boundaries of defence, and why I'm pleased this conference has got a broad participation in it. Our highly capable ADF is only as flexible as the supply chain that supports it, both nationally and internationally. We've been building the defence industrial base in an effort to strengthen those supply chains. We're seeking to maximise Australian industry participation in major material projects and to support innovation through a $730 million investment in the Next Generation Technologies Fund and a $640 million investment in the Defence Innovation Hub. Companies that had never before engaged in defence business are now forming part of that supply chain. The Defence Export Strategy strengthens the supply chain by building resilience. Australian industry cannot sustain itself on the needs of the ADF alone. New markets and opportunities to diversify will help unlock the full potential of our industry and Australia has already proven that it can take on the best in the world. An Australian company designed and built the world-leading CFAR active phased array radar. And we have other world-class capabilities from armoured vehicles, designed and built by Tullus, to ships built here in Australia. This investment in our resilience must extend to thinking seriously about the type of actions that may impact the Australian way of life and how we need to react to them. We need to build resilience, agility and versatility into the economy, trade routes, infrastructure, our military capabilities and the democratic pillars of our government. For defence, our partnerships with domestic national security agencies are critical, but we need to look just beyond these agencies in order to ensure our sovereignty. Defence already has strong relationships with the national intelligence communities, foreign affairs and trade, home affairs and our law enforcement agencies. But we seek to build our links with state agencies, industry and academia. What other expertise are we missing out on by not thinking out of the box on those who are critical to our national sovereignty? I don't have the answers to that question, but through further engagement with all stakeholders, uh, we can piece together a clearer view of how innovative and imaginative our interoperability within our country can become in order to ensure all those elements of our nation help us avoid losing a conflict before it starts. As we move into this rapidly evolving future of ours, it is time that we prepare a future ready force. It's important that we gain an understanding of what constitutes conflict versus competition and how we might adapt our actions to work across that spectrum of activities. We can't afford to be found wanting on any potential battlefield, including space or cyberspace, within our region or afar, or within our domestic infrastructure here at home. We need to optimise the utility of our equipment for all the roles we might be asked to perform, to look for new opportunities and establish clear, well-considered policies and processes that allow us to anticipate and respond to new situations. We must also build versatility and arm our people with high-end training, which allows them to analyse, to test and adjust to the battlefield environment in which they may find themselves. That's a difficult prospect at a time when the ADF's tempo is necessarily at elevated levels in our region and beyond. But it's our people, their equipment and the processes that will need to be resilient, agile and therefore successful. We must remember that establishing and maintaining strong partnerships, internationally and domestic, matter to us enormously. And finally, we must be practical, agile and versatile experts uh, in the security environment, which enables us to work within our region and to provide us the best chance of winning now, in 2025 and beyond. Thank you.